Welcome to Daily Living with Father Chapin, where we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Yes, my friends, that is what we do. Sometimes the Bible can be a bit confusing, so we bust it down like a fraction. We're asking questions along the way. Questions like, what do these Gospels have to do with me? How can I take these Gospels and apply them into my daily living? so that I can become a reflection of God's love to a world, let's face it, don't know God for sure, and definitely is in deep need of more love. Don't you think? I mean, take a look around. There's a lot of bad news bears out there. How can I take the good news of Jesus Christ as presented in his Gospels and apply it into my daily living so that I can become light in this darkness? I want to be a tool in the hand of God making present his kingdom, not someday but today and every day. And that's what this show is all about. And I'm so glad that you could join us today. Oh, we got a good one. But before we get into our show today, I'd like to take the time to welcome our new affiliate, TXA Channel 21, Dallas, Fort Worth. Howdy, folks. It's good to be with you. So excited. What do you say? We take the time to quiet our minds put ourselves in the presence of God. You know, we spent so much time going here, going there, doing this, doing that. How often do we just stop and say, where am I going? The good news about the good news is that God wants to lead you. And he does it in many, many ways in what I like to call the quiet voice. Kind of like one of those GPS systems in your car. The lady might say, take a right in 100 yards, and you might mistakenly go left. That GPS system will reroute you in the same way. You might make a mistake. God will reroute you and bring you back into his love. God's got a lesson for you today, my friend. The question is, are you ready to be the student? One very powerful way that God reveals himself to us is through his word. Because his word is alive. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're reading from the Gospel of John, 18th chapter. What is this? Verses 33 through 37. Pilate said to Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this on your own or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your, no, your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I'm a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The gospel of the Lord. And what a gospel it is. This is a deep pool, my friends, calling the kids. It's going to be good. This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. You stick around. We'll be right back. And we're going to talk about this gospel and a few other things along the way. Here as we consider God's word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living with Father Chapin. It is such a pleasure to be able to come into your home each and every week and share the good news, but it's a bit expensive. So I would ask you to consider grabbing a piece of paper and a pencil, and at the next break, I'm gonna share with you some details how you can become a partner with Daily Living, and together, we can take the good news to a lost world. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. Who do you say I am? My friend, that could be the most important question anybody could ever ask you. Because how you answer that one question pretty much determines how you're going to answer just about every other question. Who do you say that I am. Through the years, there's been much debate around that question, a lot of opinion. Today, we're in the Gospel of John, and 
As you know, I love the Gospel of John, 14th chapter. Got to be one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible. But today we're in the 18th chapter, and John is giving us a first-hand account of the chaotic events that led to the crucifixion of our Lord. And a whole lot has happened in a very short period of time. Once again, we are picking up in the middle of a larger story, a story that would behoove you to know. So you should consider uh, reading the 18th chapter of the Gospel of John. It begins with Jesus being arrested. The soldiers enter into the garden with lanterns and torches. Peter draws his sword, cuts off the ear of the high priest slave Malchus. Jesus rebukes Peter, says, put that sword back in its scabbard. Soon Peter will deny even knowing Jesus. Jesus is then brought to the high priest. His name was Ananias. And after questioning Jesus for a little bit, Ananias decides to bind him in chains and send him off to Caiaphas. He's your problem, Caiaphas. Soon, Jesus appears in front of Caiaphas, the high priest, in the middle of the night. And there is a secret trial, which, by the way, is illegal by Judaic law. But Caiaphas was above the law. He was the entire Supreme Court wrapped up in one guy. He had the power of life and death. So they bring Jesus in front of Caiaphas, and a court is quickly convened. And the questioning begins. Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Kind of gets back to that whole question, who do you say I am? Jesus looks at Caiaphas and says, I am. Now, to understand the profundity of this response, one must first understand where it is coming from. And it is coming from the book of Exodus. When God spoke to Moses through the burning bush, he said, I am who am. Something that I'm fairly confident would not have been lost on Caiaphas. The use of these words, I am, is a literary technique employed by the gospel writer John. We see it used seven times throughout his gospel as he stresses the divinity of Jesus. So that phrase, I am, it, this is big. But Caiaphas is not pleased. In fact, Mark tells us that Caiaphas tore his garment, which I guess was a thing when you were offended. Who knew? He says, we have all heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him as worthy of death. So why? Well, because he was claiming to be God. So they had all they needed. By their own law, he was worthy of being stoned to death. So they bring Jesus to, from uh, the court of Caiaphas to the praetorium where Pilate lives. Now, some people might have gotten a little confused at the Easter play and think that Pilate was somehow the king of Israel, but that was, of course, not the case. That would be Herod Antipas, who was a psychopathic killer installed as king by Rome and controlled by Rome. Pilate was a completely different story. Pilate was governor. He was prefect. He was like mid-level management. He was sent there by Rome to Israel to do two things. Number one, to keep the peace. And number two, to keep the taxes flowing. And let me tell you, this pesky people on the outskirts of the Roman Empire who had a long history of rebellion was not a plump assignment and Pilate did not want to be there. The ancient historian Josephus tells the story that when Pilate first arrives in Judea, he arrives with large banners with the face of Tiberius. So he, he wasn't subtle. <laughs> Talk about making a bad first impression because this, of course, enraged the Jews. But Pilate didn't stop there. He went as far as to plant a golden eagle, which was the symbol of Rome's power, 
in the middle of the temple. And of course, they go crazy. But Pilate doesn't care. But my friends, he had seriously miscalculated. Because you see, Rome had a long-standing policy that when they conquered lands, the conquered lands could retain their own culture, even be ruled by their own people. Of course, Rome got to choose who, who those people were, were, would be, but the point is this. Rome was not trying to make everybody else like them. So the Golden Eagle was just, that, that was a bridge too far. So when word got back to the higher-ups, and the higher-ups leaned over and told Pilate to get rid of the Golden Eagle, oh, boy, that made him look bad. And from that day, there was an incurable wound festering between Pilate and his people. They don't like each other. So when Caiaphas and his gang bring Jesus to Pilate, they knock on the door. Because, of course, they can't come in. Judaic law would have forbidden that. Judaic law is very clear as it states that if you enter the house of a Gentile, it will defile you. Even though if you read the Old Testament, you will never find that law. Why? Because it's a man-made law. Why? Because that's what we do. So Pilate comes out and he asks, what charge do you bring against this man? And they answer, well, if he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you, which is really not an answer. That's pretty evasive. But they don't bring a charge against Jesus because Pilate is the prefect. Pilate's the governor. He's got the power. He's the judge. He would be the one to bring charges. But you see, Pilate doesn't want anything to do with these people. You and your silly religion. So Pilate sends them away and says, take them yourself. Judge them according to your law. In other words, get off my porch. He's washing his hands. And they say, we do not have the right to execute anyone. Which is laughable. Because they had no problem with stoning people to death. It was in their law. Look at what they did to Stephen. They didn't ask Pilate's permission for that. So why are they asking now? Well, by saying we do not have the right to put a man to death, they're opening up the door. They're paving the way for the word that Jesus had spoken the prophets and all that they had spoken to be fulfilled when they indicated, and Jesus himself indicated, what kind of death he would die. Because, you see, here's the deal, my friends. In this play that we call human life, God's in control. Even in the deep hills and valleys of our lives, God is sovereign. Or as some like to say, God's got this. And the prophet Isaiah spoke of the crucifixion hundreds of years before the Persians invented it. And later, the Romans perfected it. And what did Isaiah say? He said he was pierced for our transgressions. That's what he said. And then remember when, when, when Nicodemus came to Jesus at night? Remember that conversation? What did Jesus say? He said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man will be lifted up, and those who look upon him will be saved. That's what he said. So now we have Pilate, who has given them permission to do what they want to do. Why? Because his word has to come to pass. Why? Because it always does. This is Daily Living on Father Chapin. You stick around, we'll be right back, and we will continue to talk about this gospel here as we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living. If you feel like you're being fed by this ministry, I would ask you to prayerfully consider a partnership with Daily Living and what we're trying to do here. 
a monthly gift of any amount that you feel comfortable with, and I will send you a monthly newsletter, and if you provide an email address, a script of the show prior to its broadcast. Just write a check to Daily Living, P.O. Box 339, Nitro, West Virginia, 25143. You can also go on the website at mydailyliving.com to give through PayPal, and together we can shine the light of the good news in a whole lot of dark places. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. Now, just for the break, we were talking about how the religious leadership of Israel is bringing Jesus to Pilate, who, by the way, is not interested in their problem. He wants nothing to do with these people. But Jesus is standing in front of him, and so he asks him a question. Are you the king of the Jews? Now, we might read that and think it's a question, but, but it really wasn't. Pilate's really kind of mocking him here. It's really more of a statement than a question. It's really more like something like, well, you, you're the king of the Jew. And again, the prophet Isaiah talks about this moment. He had no form or majesty that we should look upon, no beauty that we should desire him, meaning he looked like an ordinary person like you and I. He looked like a carpenter from Nazareth wearing sandals. He certainly did not look like a king. So I think Pilate's kind of playing with him here. And it's interesting, well, at least to me, it's interesting that Pilate does not ask him, are you the Messiah? No. He does not ask him, are you the Son of God? No. He, he's very specific in what he asks. Are you king of the Jews? In other words, are you claiming to be a king, because if you are, that's a problem, because there's only one king. His name is Caesar. Are you king of the Jews? And I love, I love how Jesus answers. He says, do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Again, kind of puts its finger on that question, who do you say I am? And I, and I kind of feel like Jesus is actually talking to Pilate in the same way that he would be talking to you and me. So Pilate, have you heard about me? Did you hear the messages? Have you heard about the miracles? I'm here for you, Pilate. Or have you heard from me only because of those guys out there that brought me here to you? And Pilate responds, I'm not a Jew, am I? And boy, that's exactly how this world responds. There's a whole big difference between knowing who Jesus is and actually meeting him. If you are raised in a Christian home, this is a very good thing. But you don't get to ride the coattails of your parents into eternity. You might go to church on Sunday and listen to a priest or a preacher tell you all about Jesus, and that's a good thing. But you're not going to meet Jesus until you accept the reality of who he is and let him in. And I'm talking all in. Remember last week we were talking about blind Bartimaeus? Remember how he threw his cloak aside, sprang up? Remember that cloak was everything he had? Why? Because he knew he needed him. What about you, my friend? What are you willing to throw aside to come to Jesus? Do you even know that you need him? Hear me when I say that you will never have a relationship with Christ until you first understand the necessity for a relationship with Christ. And you will find him in his word, which is why I say all the time on this program, you need to read his word to find Jesus. It's a solo mission. It's not a group mission. It's intimate. It's face to face. Pilate says, your own nation and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was, 
then my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. Now, I got to figure when he said this, Pilate must have been stunned. But now he finally has what he's looking for. So, you are a king. Who do you say I am? Is he a king? Yes, he is. But a whole different kind of king. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And he goes on to say, for this I was born, for, the, for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth hears my voice. My friends, we can ring the bell because we have hit the rock bottom, the deepest of meanings of this gospel. When we think of king, or at least when I think of a king, I think of a castle. I think of worldly power. I think of war, conquering lands, authority, strength. I'm telling you what, when those people were shouting Hosanna in the highest and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord as Jesus entered Jerusalem for Passover, that's what they were thinking, a warrior king who is going to lead a revolt against Rome and restore Israel to its rightful place of glory. Now they're looking at a man bound in chains, standing before the authority of Rome, doesn't look like a king, not acting like a king, because Jesus is describing a different kind of kingdom, a kingdom of truth, and not a kingdom of war. Yet for centuries, Christians have been killing people in the name of Jesus with the war cry, convert or die. You're either with us or you're against us. Kill the infidel. Yet all the while, Jesus is saying, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. In other words, his kingdom is a kingdom of truth and not a kingdom of swords. Put your sword back in its scabbard. The good news clearly teaches us that we need to love one another, especially difficult people. Yet war and violence in the name of God continues to ravage our world. For this I was born. For this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth hears my voice. And then here it comes. Pilate looks at Jesus and he says, Truth? What is truth? And boy, that's the question, isn't it? What is truth? Of course, we live in a world that denies the existence of absolute truth. We live in a world that has reduced truth to an opinion. We live in a world where my truth is just as good as your truth. And that is a lie. Because some things are true for everybody. Now, the problem with denying the existence of absolute truth which our world does, the $10 word is relativism. The problem with denying absolute truth is that without truth, there can be no meaning. And a life without meaning is a life of spiritual confusion and disorientation. God said, if you eat of this fruit, you will die. We did, we ate of it, and we did die spiritually. We cannot navigate this world like a ship on a stormy sea trying to navigate into a harbor. There are many hidden rocks, dangerous currents in this life. And the captain of the vessel must rely on a pilot, a navigator, one who knows the harbor, somebody who knows the dangers and can steer the ship successfully through the channel, avoiding the rocks. My friend, your pilot is truth. And God is calling you to live in that truth. Because without a pilot, without a navigator, without truth, you are bound to end up on the rocks. And if you make yourself the highest authority in your life, if it's you who gets to decide what is good and evil, you put yourself in the land of post-truth. 
and in the land of post-truth, facts become subservient to feelings. Our world is a land of post-truth, where truth has been reduced to an opinion. And what we end up with is a world that doesn't want to hear the truth because the truth is often uncomfortable. But God wants you to live in truth. Let us not fall for the lie that this world is trying to sell us. The lie that somehow joy and peace is found in the passing things of this world. That is not true. Because true joy can only be found in truth. And it's a truth that will set you free. For this I was born. For this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth hears my voice, my friends. What voice are you following today? The voices of this world that are trying to convince you that joy and peace is found in the passing pleasures of this world? Or his world, his truth, his kingdom? Like I said, it's a truth that will set you free and ultimately carry you home. You know, every day in this country, somebody does something nice for somebody else. Today, why don't you let that somebody be you? Because the best vitamin for a Christian is be one. This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. Hope you can come back next week and we'll do it again. Until then, I hope you let God live in your life, and I bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.